born. Of course it does. Absolutely. Amen. Of course it tells us about the birth of Jesus. Amen. Well, it would only make sense that if you really believe the Bible, you should be able to figure out when he was born. And we believe we figure that out pretty easy because, again, like Paul said, this gospel we preach, what makes it different than the gospel a lot of people preach is that our gospel is according to the Scripture. Amen? Amen. So, if you got this God of the Bible who wants to save people, amen, and you got sinners who need a Savior, <laughs> something's going to happen. And so... Uh, for those that are really true Bible believers, you can get it if you want it. But of course, the truth is uh, sometimes people want to be dumb on, on purpose. And that's why Peter said that they're, uh, they're ignorant, willingly ignorant, is how Peter wrote. He said they are willingly ignorant. See, they want to stay dumb. Please don't confuse me with the facts, you know. <laughs> I've got my opinion. <laughs> and that's how the world is. But... Uh, but here we are, this is that time of year when the Catholic Church celebrates to even today, officially. You know, every day of the week on the Catholic calendar, it's got to be something. And so uh, this is when they celebrate Michael Mass. And they call it Michael Mass only because, again, he's definitely the only Bible uh, angel mentioned as an archangel. And they just assumed that Gabriel would be. And then, of course, according to the uh, Apocrypha, there's you know at least seven archangels. <laughs> so they call this, you know, Archangel uh, Sunday, so to speak, or Michael Mass. Uh, they call it because the truth is, yeah, because the angels were singing to the shepherds when Jesus was born. See, see, somebody originally. Uh, did read and know a little bit of Bible. <laughs> but of course, it didn't take them long. And pretty soon, they just have all these celebrations. But if you ask them why, well, they couldn't tell you why. You know. And yet, well, wait a minute. Let's go back nine months. What do we got then on December 25th? Oh, that's when Jesus was conceived. That's when the angel came to Mary and told her, hey, in nine months, you're going to have a baby. How can this be? I don't even know a man. <laughs> and so it all goes perfectly, see. The Bible is right on. Amen. Feast of Tabernacles, the God of nature is nature's God. Solstice, so forth, so on. Perfect. So uh, it's nice to know that somebody's got it. <laughs> and uh, we have it, amen. And all the, if we were to go to Israel today, let's go to Israel. And we'd go into a church. We'd go into a church in Israel, and of course, it's a lot of people that are Jewish. It's, it's mostly a Messianic congregation. They would tell you that straight up. And we'd find that they're right along with us. They're celebrating Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, and because this is when Jesus was born. Amen. You're going to win Jews, buddy, if you've got a Bible that matches with, uh, the Bible. <laughs> and what God said to the Hebrews about their Savior. And and, uh, and when you win them, you don't want to win them to some Catholic Santa Claus God. You know, that ain't going to get it. You know, but boy, if you got Bible, whoo wee And uh, how many hundreds of Jews have been saved once they realize, wow, this is the real Messiah. He came according to the scriptures. See? And so that's what's lacking here in the West. But yet, praise the Lord, there's a few people that know it. And, and they're with us. Uh, so uh, that's what it's all about so we're happy our kids can put on that little reenactment again to help us remember Amen. what it was like for Jesus to come and how he came in fulfillment of the scriptures of course it was wrapped around to his cousin John the Baptist and how he was born and so forth and so on too so it's just wonderful uh, to know these things and know our history know wherever we speak and not just have to try to plug Jesus into Santa Claus somewhere because that's what the world thinks we're supposed to do, you know. You got to pity all of our friends that just join hands with Catholics on the name of winning them. I'm reminded of something somebody told me once. They said, well, you know, winning souls, that's what it's all about. We got to win souls, got to win souls. I said, no, no, you don't have to win souls, but you got to be right with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you're right with the Lord, then you will win souls. Mm -hmm. 
don't you know from that time to about this, that person has not really ever sat down and talked to me because, you know, the truth is, in their life and in the churches they were part of, as long as you're winning souls, that justifies however you want to live. <laughs> you don't have to be right with God. And I'd rather be right with God. Amen. So I'm glad that uh, you're here, and I'm glad that you're here to help us celebrate. And again, we've invited some people. We hope they come. They may not come, but they're invited to come. I hope they come. And because uh, it's great to just zoom in on what Jesus did for us, and it's not clouded with Santa Claus, Easter bunnies, chocolate, uh, you know, peeps and yellow eggs and yellow candy canes or anything else. So let's go ahead and take up our Sunday school offering this morning. Amen. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. Here you go, Daniel. I guess I'm going to put you to work, buddy. All right. Go ahead and pray for us too, Daniel, okay? Father. Uh, awesome. Our King James Bible is. Amen. So let's go ahead and be dismissed for Sunday school. And we're going to finish up Joshua for sure today. <laughs> I've tried to finish it two weeks. But I'm going to finish it today. I promise. <laughs> I'm get, I finally got it down to the last two verses. I think I should be able to finish it, don't you? And uh, so we'll see. <laughs> I get so busy chasing my rabbits sometimes. Joshua 24. I'm going to start reading at 29. Read all the way down here. This few, these few verses here. So Joshua 24, 29, and it came to pass after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, mm -hmm. you, you know, we can always have fun with people and tell them how, well, we have nuns in our church. You know, Joshua, well, this is a son of a nun, amen. <laughs> and uh, we preach it every, every Sunday, uh, Romans 3. How there's none righteous, no, not one. Amen. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. Amen. Amen. So uh, we're a church. We have nuns too. We even have some pretty bad habits once in a while. <laughs> and it came to pass after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnasserah, which is in Mount Ephraim on the north side of the hill Gash. And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua and which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. So in other words, all the veterans, as long as the veterans were alive, everybody pretty well mind their P's and Q's, walk the straight and narrow. But boy, once the last one died, they went right back to picking up the worldly habits of Easter rabbits, chocolate bunnies, Christmas trees, and so God began to turn their enemies against them and put them into bondage. Verse 32, And the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, buried they in Shechem, in a parcel of ground, which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamer, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of silver, and it became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. And Eliezer, the son of Aaron, died, and they buried him in a hill that pertained to Phinehas, his son, which was given him, in Mount Ephraim. Mm -hmm. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, again, we're thankful for our heritage. We're thankful we've got a heritage to pass on to our kids, whether or not they <laughs> line up or not. That's between them and you. So we're thankful for uh, that great truth and that we can serve you with a clear conscience and uh, no guilt is necessary. Mm -hmm. And... Um, we pray, Lord, for your Holy Ghost conviction to fall on our friends and family, that they would uh, want to walk that straight and narrow. And in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. 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 And so that's kind of what this section here is about. You know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't get him baptized if you don't want to be. 
And it's the same thing with your kids and grandkids. Uh, the best you can probably do is try to set them an example. You know, you can try to teach them, you can try to tell them, but believe me, you're teaching them to tell them they're going to fight that to the day you're dead. <laughs> and somehow or another, they got to make a statement. They got to let you know that they know more than you do. And to your dying day, they'll be out to prove that. But yet, all you can hope for is that maybe somehow your testimony for God will leak through. And, uh, and it'll preach, your life will preach better than their words and, uh, and their choices they make, especially when they try to justify their carnality. Now, verse 31 is important for us because we, we have to recognize, as I mentioned last week, it's right to follow a man who is on the right path. So many people talk about their heritage and then you look at their heritage and they've got no heritage to follow. It's all wickedness and ungodliness. Well, my dad was a drunk and I'm going to be a drunk and we're going to have a party in hell. No, you won't. <laughs> you just haven't read the book of Job. Because <laughs> right, right. if you read the book of Job, you know that there's no partying in hell. Mm -hmm. Everybody in hell is your enemy, including your family. Because your family will not recognize their relationship to you as family in hell. And... Uh, Look at um, 1 Thessalonians 1, 6, where Paul said, And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of uh, the Holy Ghost. I'm so glad I know the Holy Ghost. Amen. I'm so glad I only don't know about a Holy Spirit. But I have the Holy Ghost. And I have been under the Holy Ghost anointing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know about the Holy Ghost of God and why the King James Bible over 90 times says Holy Ghost and only four times Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And like I mentioned a little bit a minute ago, as I was reflecting on how in church we're on 1 Corinthians 13, and as we begin to think, just think a little bit about the word charity. And what does the word charity mean? I mean, I am 67 years old. And I'm just trying to tell you that, you know, it just really dawned on me this week. I don't have a lockdown, simple, for sure, definition of charity. In recent years, we've happily zoomed in on the idea, well, of course, it's definitely a love in action. It's not just the word love. But because in the Greek, the word, you know, there's at least four, perhaps five different words used in the Greek for love. Um, the whole world's totally confused about <laughs> what love is. And of course, the new versions always just say, oh, it's the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. You know, if I have not love, I'm like a tinkling single and, uh, symbol and so forth. And, uh, it's so cheap and shallow. So I, as I begin, I thought, oh, well, let's go to the computer and see what, let's look up the word charity and see what kind of definitions. Of course, right away we get, you know, an organization that gives food away for people with clothes. Right, right, right. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and so uh, it was so interesting because I found a fellow, he, this fellow said, you know what? Uh, one of my friends came to me and said to me something about, Oh, you mean you're into that sloppy agape? And he said, when he said that, he said, I began to do a little research. And happily I found that the King James Bible doesn't say love in 1 Corinthians 13, but it says the word charity. And the fellow said, as I read the King James, in 1 Corinthians 13, I began to realize how beautiful it was that charity is a better and more proper word. Unlike all the new versions that simply talk about love. And I said, now, oh, isn't this beautiful and isn't this powerful? We've got us another King James Bible believer all because the King James Bible has charity. Then, of course, it just bowls me over 
because here I am, 67 years old, and I have lived through this spell and this time where Satan, through the educational systems, was able to get in there and hoodwink these people into thinking all oh, the cool thing is go with the new versions. So that now, over 400 years, boys and girls, for over 400 years, God's churches, and even a lot of churches that weren't God's churches, but God's people were in those churches, like a Methodist church or even a Lutheran church, or just take your pick. A lot of denominations out there. But there was over 400 years, they all used the same Bible. Yes. And they all spoke, sang songs about mansions, charity, uh -huh. Holy Ghost, Lutheran. Uh, what do they do? <laughs> Now they use a Bible, don't even have their church name in it. But I don't know what they do. I'll have to go visit them and ask their pastor sometime. But here's a modern church that is hearing no songs about charity, reading no poetry about charity. Charity is not a part of the modern churches. So like I told the church Thursday, and I discussed it, wrote it on the board, we took a picture of the board, because these are just my thoughts this week. The atheism of the 21st century churches. Because all these churches, again, all these churches have no mansions, no Holy Ghost, and no charity. That's tragic. That's tragic. That When I was growing up, even my next door neighbor, you know, knew about charity, understood charity, spoke about charity, sang about charity, read poetry about charity. Everyone understood that a Christian's to practice charity. <laughs> but nobody, nothing in the new world that we're living in, that word's gone. Just chuck it out. And I still say we gotta learn faith, hope, and charity, amen. As uh, Roy Rogers and Dale Evans sang it, amen. Because that, what a great song. And that song, see, people say, what did they say? What are they saying? Charity? What's that? <laughs> amen? Right. And so uh, I shared with Brother Keith yesterday at the old folks' home. I, I sat down and wrote myself a little note as I've been just thinking and meditating about it. And I thought, how would I define charity? How should we define charity? Over the years, I've been blessed to uh, have been around some friends that challenged me to know some things and believe some things. And one of the things I have memorized is a definition of what is, what is the will of God? And the answer is, uh, it's a conviction wrought in the heart of a believer by the Holy Spirit to do a certain thing. And I said, you know what, it's sad that uh, we don't have any simple definition of charity. And so I thought, I think at this time, this is what I would say charity is. So I'm going to share it with you this morning. Charity, a Holy Ghost driven passion that reflects Jesus Christ. I think that that's about the best definition I could give for what is charity. Amen? But it's a Holy Ghost driven passion that reflects Jesus Christ. Because there's no doubt when you read through as Brother Keith's going to do in a few minutes and what it says, what charity does, what it don't do. Man, Jesus epitomizes all of it, and yet, no, this is what Paul's saying to us. What good are you? You know every language of the world, smart Alex, Mr. Brains, Dr. So-and-so, Mr. PhD. Because uh, if you ain't got charity, you don't know about the hill of beans. <laughs> Amen? And you got enough money, you can bestow all your money to, to feed all the poor of the world, but what good would it be if you don't have charity? 
And so it is with these elders here. They set a good example for the younger people. They were there for them. But boy, as soon as that authority was gone, man, them kids, they turned right back into the worldliness and wickedness. And so it's okay to follow somebody if they're doing right. But boy, if somebody's doing wrong, you don't have to follow them. Amen. You're supposed to follow after God. Follow after Jesus. Obey the Holy Ghost of God. But everyone needs to fulfill their own work of God. Amen. Now, not everybody's work is the same, as we'll discuss in, some, in church here in a few, little while. Like uh, Paul told us in Ephesians chapter 5, in verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. You know, as sure as God led me to Monroe, Michigan, and I'm here to stay. God hasn't led everybody to Monroe, Michigan. You know, I can't hardly believe God will lead anybody anywhere else, but yet he has in his sovereignty. And so you have to acknowledge that. They got to fulfill their calling just like you have to fulfill yours. Amen. And if God wants them in Arizona, then we got to pray for them in Arizona. Amen. And we got to pray God's hedge of protection on them there. If you want some in Florida, we have to say, well, praise the Lord. God bless you, you know. Do what he wants you to do. Everyone needs to grow and mostly feed themselves the wonderful truths of the word of God. But of course, that usually comes with proper discipleship. And that's why discipleship is very important. Now, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, here's how Paul told his young Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 12, that no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers, see, in word, in conversation, in charity. Brother Keith was telling me, he says he was running the word charity in all the new versions too. And he found that, yeah, for sure the new versions don't use it in 1 Corinthians 13, but they'll occasionally put it in, like here where it's put in. That way they can say that they didn't totally eliminate charity. <laughs> but a few, not too many, but a few of the versions will keep this word here. Probably the New King James or what, something that's trying to claim to be, you know, uh, just a rewriting of, a, of the of the. Of the true receptus text mm -hmm. in word in conversation in charity in spirit in faith in purity amen 2 Timothy 2.15 we need to study see just because you're saved it ain't going to automatically come to you <laughs> The Holy Ghost that wrote this book wants you to know this book and get real familiar with it, comparing Scripture with Scripture, spiritual with spiritual, and get his definition of things. And in 2 Timothy 2.15, he says what? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a work man that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Because again, it has proper and right divisions and if you're not careful a lost man can take this book and find just as many screwball ideas as anybody else yep. but because he don't have the indwelling illumination of the Holy Ghost he won't be able to put nothing together right he won't pick up on this subtle but great truth I was so blessed this morning when brother Jim told me he was talking to uh, uh Ethan about because Ethan was jumping around like he was a toad frog out here and he said he was ribbit the uh, ribbit the toad ribbit the toad and Jim said do you know the difference between a frog and a toad and he stood there a minute and said well they're spelled different <laughs> isn't that wonderful <laughs> see that boy's been taught right yes. and he's got the right answer you're going to always know yeah. You're going to always know there could be a difference in something when they're spelled differently. Amen? Amen. And <laughs> that's a simple but great truth. And so 2 Peter, amen, chapter 3. Now on the bus this week, we were talking about synonyms. It's amazing what you can get into on the bus. And, uh, 
But in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul said in verse 18, the last verse there, I mean, not Paul, but Peter, but grow in grace. Amen. Now here he's warning him about Paul. Here Peter's warning him about, boy, a lot of people can read after Paul. And if they don't know how to rightly divide the scriptures, they can sure get screwed up. <laughs> I'm sure Peter knew that uh, by experience. He said, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So see, again, thank God for teachers. Thank God that God's given us in the church teachers. And uh, the Bible speaks of how can I know except some man guide me? The fellow asked Philip when Philip asked him if he understood what he was reading in the book of Isaiah. Because Philip knew that he could be there as a guide to help the fellow. But the, ultimately the teacher is the Holy Spirit of God himself. Amen? Amen. And so it's very important that Joshua 24, 31 we see that simple truth that, well, as long as the elders were around to give the direction to the people, uh, they stayed pretty well on the straight and narrow and kept doing the works of the Lord. Uh, but like Joshua, uh, Judges uh, is going to tell us right off the bat in chapter 1, verse 1, it didn't take them long, though, that after Joshua died, that they went right back into the things of the world. Right. And got God mad at them as a nation. Uh, so 31, all the days of Joshua, all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua and which, and which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. So Joshua was the first man to be guided by a book. Amen. Amen. Moses could hand Joshua the book. And he had the first five books of Moses. Joshua did. And so as Joshua was leading Israel, look at Joshua 1.8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. The only time that's ever in the Bible. If you want to get some prosperity training, this, this is the key right here. This is the verse. Thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. You want some success in life? You want to be prosperous and have success? Then you got to get in the book. And every real man that's successful in the world will remind everyone to get, you got to get back to the book and these principles of the book is how God will either bless you or he'll curse you. And you, ultimately, you do want God's blessings, don't you? <laughs> Amen? Amen? And so Joshua, though it wasn't an easy, though there was struggle, though there was fighting, sweating and tears, though there was slashing and gnashing of teeth, in the end, though, he could be attributed as a great successful leader and warrior that he was because he had the book. And the victorious life of Joseph reveals the marvelous works of God are connected with the obedience to the Holy Scriptures. And as I mentioned, as I'm preparing this message for the preachers down there in Indiana, uh, and I was reviewing what J.M. Carroll said in his book, The Trail of Blood, and how Bible-believing Baptists have always been associated with the oldest denominational world in history, Anabaptists. So, man, I made sure to put that on the slide. And, Amen. <laughs> and as he's listing these ten things that make up a, a, a New Testament Bible-believing church, and two times he mentions God's New Testament Bible-believing church goes by the laws of the New Testament. See? See, we take this New Testament as almost law and legalistically as the Old Testament Jew did his Old Testament covenant. 
So when he says in the New Testament that a woman can't prophesy with her head covered, that's the way it's supposed to be. Now happily, we don't seem to have any ladies wanting to prophesy in our church. So we definitely don't need any ladies to be having to put anything on their head. Amen. And of course, Paul definitely covers it. Of course, the ladies' long hair is her covering. So for sure, any lady with long hair don't need no covering. But some churches go way overboard on that truth. Because Paul did discuss that in 1 Corinthians 11. And the more power to him. Compared to so many that don't consider anything in the Bible to be law at all. Because they've had this dispensational grace crap preached to them so much. And grace has become so cheap that it's, it's, it literally is the sloppy agape. <laughs> or in the name of agape love, we don't have any rules or regulations. Oh, yeah, we do. We have all kinds of them. <laughs> Heaven forbid. <laughs> and it's kind of been an interesting thought to think that, wow. See, here we've got this Bible. And see, we're supposed to always be checking ourselves with Bible. But no, this new sloppy agape stuff means, uh, well, since I got a spirit, and his spirit wrote the Bible, I don't even need the Bible. Well, yeah, oh, that's right. That's what uh, they begin to teach in Quakerism. <laughs> that's where all this whole New Age movement got going. And it's so sad, because, again, it dominates the world today. So what a man does with the Bible determines what God will do with that man. Amen? Amen. And uh, especially is that true of, <laughs> of the Word of God. <laughs> Amen? And so that's where you better stay true. You better know what the book is and what God is and stay true. Because believe you me, a lot of people's eternity is resting on it. Look at Proverbs 13. 13, 13 ought to be a good verse for us, huh? 13, 13. Proverbs 13, 13. You know you're going to have a good verse when you got two 13 showing up like that. America was founded on 13 colonies, amen? 13 stripes, 13 stars. 13 is that number for uh, rebellion in the Bible. And in the 13th year they rebelled, it says in Genesis 13. So, yeah. Whoso despises the word shall be destroyed, but he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. Amen. Amen. You can't neglect the book. Oh, you might get dust on it. <laughs> you might think you can neglect it. You might say, oh, watch me. But believe you me, to whom much is given, much is required. Amen. And of course, we pray for our kids and we want God's best for them. And we sometimes watch them make poor choices. But we can rest assured knowing that just like we've learned that the book is the book for a reason. They'll learn it too, even if it's the hard way. <laughs> and as long as they learn it, praise the Lord. That means that uh, we'll have a wonderful time in glory when we have our big family reunion. But in the meantime, they got to run their race just like I have to run mine. You have to run yours. Mm -hmm. Some of us have high hurdles. Some of us have low hurdles. But there will be a few hurdles in the race. Look at Isaiah 66 and verse 2. For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look. You want God to look in your affairs? You want God to pay attention to you? Want God to smile on you? Even to him that is poor. I'm qualifying so far. <laughs> and, of a, and of a contrite heart. Amen. See, you can't, you can't be too cocky with God, my friend. Amen. And uh, trembleth at my word. See, some clown thought he could redefine reverence, you know. But, buddy, you can't 
meet a better definition of reverence in the Word of God than trembling at my word. Amen. Amen. <laughs> That's why I'm saying too, uh, sometimes I see this in the boys and girls on the bus because boy, they don't know. They don't have a clue what it is. They don't have a clue. But boy, when the Holy Ghost conviction grips their heart, buddy, it grips it. <laughs> and they physically get shaken. And... Uh, Again, I was a little boy once myself. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so now, let me just read you the first few verses of Judges chapter 1 because you're going to see how, wow, Judges 1.1 1, 1 picks exactly right up from Joshua because notice how it begins. Now, after the death of Joshua... It came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first to fight against them? So, of course, what did they do? Well, they went to Eliezer's son, Phinehas, who's now the priest. He'd been serving as priest a good 10 to 12 years before his dad died. So they went to him. He had on the priest's costume. He had on the breastplate. He had the urim and thummim in the pocket of the linen cloth so that through the urim and thummim, through the lights and enlightenment, they could ask the Lord any question and the high priest would put his hand in that pocket and they'd get their answer. And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. And Judah said unto Simeon his brother, Come up with me into my lot, that we may fight against the Canaanites. And I likewise will go with thee into thy lot. So Simeon went with him. And Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand. And they slew of them in Bezek, 10,000 men. And they found Adonai, Adonai Bezek in Bezek. And they fought against him and slew the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And Adonai Bezek fled and they pursued after him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his great toes. And Adonai Bezek said, Three score and ten kings have their thumbs and their great toes cut off. Gathered their meat under my table. As I have done, so God hath requited me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. Now the children of Judah had fought against Jerusalem and had taken it and smitten it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. And afterward, the children of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites that dwelt in the mountains and in the south and in the valley. And Judah went against the Canaanites that dwelt in Hebron. Now the name of Hebron before was Kerjath Arba, and they slew Shishai and Ahiman and Talmai, and from thence he went against the inhabitants of Debur, and the name of Debur before was Kirjath Sefer. And Caleb said, He that smiteth Kirjath Sefer and taketh it to him will I give Exa my daughter to wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it, and he gave him Exa, his daughter to wife. And it came to pass when she came to him that she moved him to ask of her father a field. And she lighted from off her ass, and Caleb said unto her, What wilt thou? And she said unto him, Give me a blessing, that thou hast given me a south land. For thou hast given me a south land, give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her, Caleb gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. And so we've read some of this before, because again the Bible mentioned some of this of Caleb earlier, and his inheritance. And so everybody's starting out good, starting out working together as a team, 
doing the job that was done. Now they had an old wicked king there that they caught and he learned what goes around comes around. So since he had misused people that were his captives, then he got misused so he could see what it feel, felt like. <laughs> and the Lord established the law of sowing and reaping a long time ago, amen? And this act reduced the man to an animal state, of course. And uh, it's a part of sometimes having to learn life's lessons, amen? <laughs> but we'll stop right there.